آزادی بیان یعنی رو انتظار یا فری سپیچ جولیان بلانک is a man who makes his living giving talks in which he uh, encourages men and gives them practical tips about how they can uh, be violent towards women. He tells them how they can sexually abuse, rape, uh, and strangle women. And when he wanted to come into the UK to give these talks, Theresa May banned him from coming. We think she was right to ban him from coming. But crucially, because you just heard from the other side that they're in favour of legal restrictions on speech, crucially, we think that if Theresa May hadn't banned him, and the Oxford Union, or free speech debate, had decided to host him, then we should advocate for his no platform. That is to say, we don't believe, that, unlike uh, the other side, as you just heard, we don't believe that uh, whether or not people should be uh, stopped from speaking should be entirely contingent on the decisions that a government happens to take. We have our own moral standards. I, I want to come on to talk about uh, why, although we think speech acts aren't sacrosanct and, and shouldn't be free from the kind of regulation that governs other acts, why actually there's a slightly lower bar for regulating acts in the case of uh, no platforming, why it's not simply a case of free speech, and the free speech discourse is a bit disingenuous there. But first, I just want to respond to what we've heard, what we've just heard. What you just heard was, by its own admission, a phrase that was just used, a slippery slope argument, right? So you heard that if we start no platforming, say, racist and fascist, then we might end up no platforming anyone, and that would be awful. And indeed, it is awful that lots of people, we were told, are no platform who shouldn't be. Now, look at the text of the motion today. We're asked whether it is legitimate for activists to no platform people. We're not asked whether everyone who has ever been no-platformed should have been no-platformed, yeah, yeah. and we are not obliged to defend everyone who has ever been no-platformed, so bear that in mind. But more, I mean, it was a logical fallacy, but beyond that, beyond that, just think about an analogous case. Think about the case of prison. Right? Imagine someone stands up and says, look, if we start imprisoning people, we might imprison innocent people. Governments might make bad laws, and so imprison people who shouldn't be imprisoned. We can accept all those things, but we can still think, and lots of people do still think, that we should have a prison system because the consequences of not imprisoning people are really great. So although we agree that maybe people get no platform who shouldn't be, although we agree that Turks might demand to no platform trans people or fascists might demand to no platform Jews, we still think we should have a no platform policy because not no platforming anyone, as I gave the example of Julian Blanc advocating and telling men how to go and beat up women, not no, pla no platforming anyone uh, has a bad consequence. And, and just lastly, the whole content of that speech uh, was about uh, the problem of basing no platforming on subjective experience. That's not the only argument for no platforming. Neither Chi Chi nor Cisway nor I are into that kind of identity politics framing. None of us think that no platforming should be about subjective experience. We think it should be about objective harms. So that's not the only argument for no platforming. Um, but to talk now about why uh, no platforming is not simply a case of free speech. So there's a difference between giving someone a platform and allowing them free speech. It's kind of like the difference between putting someone in prison for thinking something, that's denying their free speech, and not inviting them to tea because they think something. That's not giving them a platform. So to give you an example, Ronald Reagan uh, was accused of having a soft spot for Holocaust denial, and he said, no, 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 that's not the case. Whenever I have Holocaust deniers at the dinner table, I always rush to condemn them, which raises the obvious question, why on earth are you having Holocaust deniers to dinner? Right? Now, my contention, here, my contention here is that you don't need to believe that Holocaust denial should be banned in order to be concerned that the President of the United States chooses to dine with Holocaust deniers. So why is there a lower bar for, for no platform? The first is that when we know platform people, we're not cutting off all their access to discourse, as you are when the state bans people. When activists know platform people in a particular space, it has a less severe effect. Secondly, there's a distinction between what you can say, freedom of speech, and what you should to say, what we should provide them with a platform to say. So the old example is someone farting in a lift. They should have the right to do so. It doesn't mean we should encourage everyone to do it. There's a difference there, right? And finally, finally, with the difference between no platform and free speech, everyone all the time, and this is crucial about the kind of hidden left-right politics in this debate, everyone no platforms people all the time. But what your side is doing in this debate is only focusing on those left-wing students who no platform people. So when the Daily Mail gives a column to Jan Moyer to say that Stephen Gately's death proves that homosexuality is a bad lifestyle choice, but has never given a column to me, the Daily Mail's no platform in me. And yet free speech debate and the Oxford Union aren't standing up in my defence. But when students try to participate in the same battle and say, if the Daily Mail, if Rupert Murdoch, with all his money and power, there isn't this equal marketplace of ideas, some people have a lot more money and power and social capital, if those people are denying platforms to some of us and giving platforms to bad people, why shouldn't we be allowed to deny platforms to bad people and give platforms to nice people instead? But the second reason, the second really puzzling thing uh, about this, this equation between no platform and free speech is that it hides the power dynamics, and Chichi spoke a bit about this, it hides the power dynamics at play in real cases of no platforming. There's this bizarre inversion, right? Free speech toleration developed as an enlightenment discourse in which the powerless demanded the right to criticise the powerful. And yet now the powerful demand their free speech, which they say is being cut off by student activists. Now, the bizarre thing about this is that we conceptualise freedom as something which we want because it allows us to do something with it, right? We want the freedom to speak so that we can be heard in debates. It's an ends-based reasoning for which we want freedom. 
And that kind of end space reasoning always applies for the kinds of powerful people who we want to deny platforms to. So just to give you an example, right? When David Willits went to speak at Cambridge, the, se the minister for universities, as he was troubling tuition fees, and some students stood up and protested against his speech, the University of Cambridge expelled those students for protesting because they said they'd interfered with the free speech of a man who has infinite access to newspaper articles, to column inches, to the media, to, to, to propagate his views. And then when I was at the Oxford Union and took part in a protest against David Willits, those of us who took part in the protest were taken outside the Oxford Union, the organisation Charlie runs, uh, and one of the members of the Oxford Union had her membership taken away from her for protesting against David Willits because she was told she'd interfered with his free speech. Now ask yourself this, who more needs freedom? An ordinary student who's trying to make their voice heard or David Willits who has infinite access to platforms to make his voice heard? And I'll just, I'll just finish with this uh, kind, of, kind of analogy. This conception of freedom, of free speech, which is entirely... Uh, doesn't consider power relations, is a bit like someone standing outside your room day and night screaming bullying abuse at you. And if you go to your college and say, please stop them bullying me, the college says, sorry, they have a right to free speech. Free speech exists, as you've been told, in a context of power relations, and we think that's very important. And so the real limitations on free speech are not those of us who seek to remove, I'll, I'll finish now, not those of us who seek to remove certain select platforms from already enormously powerful people. The real limits on free speech are state actions as part of the war on terror, as part of the prevent agenda, that genuinely deprive marginalised voices of their right to speak and stick them in prison if they do so. And we'd like to hear more about that and less concerned with student activists.